there was really no reason for these people to really know him yet. His first single had died at 60. I don't think 1982 had really cracked the top 10 yet. And he came out there and his band was there and he started strumming the opening chords to On the Other Hand. And he sang all in one hand. And 25,000 people stood up. They all stood up like somebody had just raised the flag. On one hand, I count the reason I could stay with you. I mean, he just had that thing that people just responded to. I mean, his voice... His voice alone was enough, but the voice and the song and just the setting and everything, I think people just realized, here's the real deal. And as they say, real recognizes real, Kyle Lenning. See now, before the 1986 Fanfare Festival, Kyle and a handful of other believers knew they had the real deal in Randy Travis. What they weren't certain of was how the public would respond to Randy's traditional country sound. Boy, were they in for a surprise. Today on the Neon Neighbors podcast, legendary producer Kyle Lenning is going to help me tell the story about how one man in the mid-80s changed country music entirely. Ladies and gentlemen, Randy Travis. Randy Travis broke in a big way in the summer of 1986. Let's go back to the summer of 1980. Bear with me here. On June 6th of that year, the movie Urban Cowboy, starring John Travolta, was released. Are you a real cowboy? Well, it depends on what you think a real cowboy is. The Urban Cowboy soundtrack was an absolute smash. It was comprised of music by both rock artists, like Bob Seger and the Eagles, and country artists, like Mickey Gilly and Johnny Lee. And for a while, on the album's popularity, country music began regularly finding its way onto the pop charts. In other words, crossing over. I think that period could kind of be remembered as there was a sort of style that was called country politics. You know, there were a lot of strings. Kenny Rogers was having big hits, and I love Kenny, and he's a great singer. Uh, but his music was starting to cross over into uh, adult contemporary and pop. Our guest today, producer Kyle Lenning. Of course, when industry executives noticed that country politan was working, they demanded more of it. The business never really knows what the public's looking for. And that's why when something is successful, the business just keeps repeating it. Real traditional country sounds weren't really what the industry was looking for back in that time. Now, to be clear, none of this to say that there wasn't traditional country music around, or for that matter, even on the charts. When telling the Randy Travis story, it's easy to lose track of the other traditionalists that came before him. Ricky Skaggs was charting in the early 80s. George Strait was around. Since my woman lived, I'm down and out. And you can't forget about the great John Anderson. And I tell her what my papa said to my mama when he got off a highball train. Oh, wake me up early, be good to my dogs, and teach my children to play. But while big hits would occasionally percolate from that brood, it was that crossover-oriented country music from folks like Ronnie Millsap that was busy dominating the airwaves. There's a stranger in my house Somebody here that I can't see 
Yeah, I got to work on a number of Ronnie records as a, as an engineer and a mixer, and uh, like Stranger in My House. I never expected that to be a huge country hit. I just felt like it was it was too sort of pop or something. But it was a number one country record, and it became a a, a big crossover record too. Before ever encountering Randy Travis, Kyle Lenning had already put together a pretty darn good resume for himself. He had technical credits on records by the likes of Jimmy Buffett and Dr. Hook, and as he mentioned, Ronnie Millsap. As a producer, he was probably at that time best known for the catalog of soft rock duo England Dan and John Ford Coley. And in the early 80s, he began producing another artist. Keith Stegall, who was an artist for Epic Records at the time. That name might ring a bell. But perhaps not as an artist. Alan Jackson, Zach Brown. I mean, Keith's uh, resume as a record producer is phenomenal. He, and he's an f- incredible musician and a great songwriter and a wonderful record producer and just a really great guy. Many of those accolades would come years later, of course. This was probably early 1985 or late 84. I, mean, I can't remember exactly. So Keith brought this cassette in and said, hey, I want to play you something. Tell me what you think. And uh, I put the cassette in, listened to about 20 seconds of it. Gonna find myself a pretty woman, one who paid for heaven be around. And stopped it and said, who is this guy? And he said, well, he's a catfish cook out at the Nashville Palace. That catfish cook out at the Nashville Palace went by the name of Randy Ray at least professionally, at that time. And though catfish cooking helped him pay some bills, it was certainly not on his list of ambitions. Were you a cook who became a singer or a singer who became a cook? <laughs> well, I was a singer who became a cook and then became a singer and, uh, and got away from cooking, I guess. He was born Randy Bruce Trawick in Marshville, North Carolina. He was a country boy at heart, grew up riding horses and admiring Roy Rogers. In certain contrast with the country music of the early 80s, the sound of Randy's youth was predictably traditional. Pedal steel guitar, twangy telecaster, and sheer heartache furnished his father's record collection. She's got that kind of love Lord, I love to hear her when she calls me sweet. Daddy's such a beautiful dream. I hate to think it My daddy was a big uh, Hank Williams fan. And so he had all his records, I guess, at one point. And uh, Hank, Lefty Frizzell, Merle Haggard, George Jones, people like that. Randy and his brother Ricky Trawick would begin performing country music growing up. I have three brothers and two sisters, and uh, believe it or not, at one time all of us were playing something. Oh, is that right? And uh, everybody gave it up except for uh, me and my brother Ricky. He's still playing some around the Carolinas. As teens, they entered a talent contest at a venue called Country City, USA, in Charlotte, North Carolina. Country City was owned by a woman named Elizabeth Hatcher, or Lib, as she was often called. If anybody doesn't know, I mean, it's pretty, I think it's pretty clear that if it wasn't for uh, Lib Hatcher, you and I would not be having this conversation about Randy Travis. I met her in a club. In fact, she owned the club in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I entered a talent contest, Mm -hmm. won the talent contest, and started working there full time. And she just really just loved the way he sounded and sang, and she became a champion of his. And it's also well documented, you know, that Randy Randy's youth was a was a troubled youth, and he got into a lots of lots of trouble and and some very serious trouble. You can add Randy Travis to the famous list of country music outlaws. But I would run away from home and uh, get into drinking and uh, got caught several times driving and trying to outrun the police and fighting and things like that. So. Yeah, it went through kind of a wild period there. Ultimately, it was Country City owner Lib Hatcher that would save the troubled young Randy from himself. She ended up taking custody of him when he was, I think, 14, because he was headed to jail. I know she kept him from going to jail. I'm pretty sure she might have saved his life, too, because the kind of trouble he was in at that time was was violent. There was a lot of violence around him as a young guy. Truthfully, she kept me from going to prison, too, um, because I uh, I had been in court so many times for so many different things, and the last time was for breaking and entering. And 
the lawyer told me that uh, you're probably going to go for five years. You know, we, I've got you out of so much, it's just not going to work again. And uh, so she kept me from going to prison at that point. In fact, that judge, he, he released me in her custody, basically, to start with. Mm -hmm. And said, uh, son, if you come before me again, bring your toothbrush because you stay. And I said, okay. The judge allowed her to, to uh, you know, take custody of him. And uh, so she really started taking control of his career and of his life at that time. And then she, she just started championing him just started taking bringing him to nashville to record to meet people to try to get things done so from the time he was about 15 i think they started coming to nashville all the while lib hatcher kept young randy trawick occupied with his work and with honing his craft keeping him from any future run-ins with the law you know basically i grew up and uh kind of started looking at myself and seeing that what i was doing was wrong and uh she was a big help, you know, as far as that goes, a lot of direction from her. And I guess the combination from her and the music, uh, uh, her and the music giving me something to do, you know, a full-time job singing rather than uh, staying in the streets all the time. <laughs> Lib and Randy's efforts during these early years would eventually lead to their first recording opportunity. Some five years under the tutelage of Lib Hatcher, a 20-year-old Randy Trawick signed a single deal with independent label Paula Records. Joe Stampley produced a couple of records, and uh, he took those around to the labels in town here and got turned down by everybody. And uh, so he put it on uh, a label that he started on, uh, Paula, which you probably are familiar with. The result? 1979's She's My Woman. She's my woman. The swampy, Jerry Reed-flavored single would actually chart at number 91 for a young Randy Trawick. Perhaps more musically interesting, and similar to the Randy Travis that we know, was its B-side, All the Praises. All the Praises There's footage on the internet of, admittedly, an uncomfortable and awkward-looking Randy performing this song on a TV appearance. While it's clear from both tunes Randy had some maturing to do, it's also clear that even at that young age, Randy knew exactly what kind of music interested him. He was a dyed-in-the-wool traditionalist long before he was ever famous. That's who he was, you know, absolutely inside out. He wasn't pretending to be anything other than a, a traditional country singer. That's all he was interested in. Realistically, that might have been why he wasn't getting famous. When Lib Hatcher and Randy moved to Nashville in the early 80s, he made friends with a who's who of famous musicians, like Little Jimmy Dickens and Johnny Russell. But none of the record labels wanted to sign him. And uh, I had been turned down by every label in Nashville, uh, trying to get signed as an artist and uh, Reason being, there wasn't a place for the traditional style of country music like uh, I wanted to do because it wasn't selling at that time. By that time, remember, country had gone pop. But Lib and Randy wouldn't take no for an answer. Lib Hatcher's experience operating a nightclub in Charlotte would really help out here. She eventually sold Country City in Charlotte after moving to Nashville, and she began managing a venue called the Nashville Palace a honky-tonk located right next door to the Grand Ole Opry. She was managed in a place called the Nashville Palace, and uh, I started working there. Famously, Lib Hatcher had him working as a cook, but he occasionally got the opportunity to perform. They were short on help in the kitchen, so I started uh, washing dishes and learned to cook, and so I did that for a while and finally got a band together and started singing, and which I did sing there for about three and a half years, but the whole time I was singing, I was still cooking and washing dishes. Enter the previously mentioned Keith Stegall. The up-and-coming musician, songwriter, and producer met Randy and Lib during their early days in Nashville. He signed on to produce a live set of Randy, really just a lower-budget, independent recording that would be sold at the Nashville Palace. 
The record would be called Randy Ray Live, available on vinyl and cassette. See, well, the only reason we did it was to just to sell to the tourists that came in the palace. But yeah, we sold a good many. A few things about the 1983 live recording. First was that it mainly featured songs written by Randy himself. Songwriting was something that he had worked on in the previous years. Yeah, I started to try to write a little bit, which I threw him away most of those <laughs> most of those early songs. So I've been trying to write for about 10 years, but the singing, you know, was always first and always will come first. By then, he had crafted a couple good tunes, though. In fact, the live Randy Ray album contains early versions of several self-written tunes that would later become hits for him. We've been doing this next song a while here at the palace, and we seem to get a few requests for it. I appreciate that. It's a song called I Told You So. I told you so, but you had. And what he played me was was a live recording, and it was really good. The other noteworthy thing about the Randy Ray live album, in late 84, early 85, that's what Keith Stegall brought in to play for Kyle Enning. I was immediately taken by the quality uh, of his voice. And I said, what's going on? And he said, nothing. He said, no, I can't get anybody to pay attention. And so I said, well, how often does he play? And he told me, and I said, I think I'll come out and just take a look at him and see see for myself and so i went out to the palace what kyle heard and saw were both striking he he was wearing a sport coat that was about two sizes too big for him and he looked comfortable but not exactly what i would call a stellar showman but he stood there and sang those songs and he sounded just like he did on the recording and i i was really impressed with him what i loved about him was how immediately identifiable his voice was how he he reminded me of great country singers, but at the same time sort of had his own sound in there, too. And he was just, you know, he was a natural. He was absolute natural. And just then, some 10 years into a sluggish music career to date, just a little bit, the ball started rolling for him. After that, the next day or so, Charlie Monk, who was uh, Keith's manager at the time, called me up and said, I heard you liked Randy, and I said, yeah. These days, listeners might identify Charlie Monk as a DJ on Willie's Roadhouse and Prime Country. Hey, it's the Monk Man, Charlie Monk on the radio. How about some John Anderson? Back then, Charlie Monk was Keith Stegall's manager. Charlie was aware of Keith's involvement with Randy, and pretty soon he himself became a stakeholder in Randy's publishing. And he said, well, why don't you call Martha Sharp? at Warner Brothers Records, she was the A&R person over there, and tell her what you think, because she's been watching him a little bit, but hasn't really signed him or done anything yet. Turns out Martha Sharp, a major A&R person at a major record label, was looking for, of all things, a traditional country singer. Because, turns out, country records stopped selling. In about 1985, fans just abandoned that country politan sound that had been doing so well. Publications like Variety and the New York Times started reporting dreadful country music record sales. In many circles, these were almost read as obituaries for the entire genre. After the boom years of the 70s, the days of the outlaws and the urban cowboy, the country music world was in a turmoil. It had sunk into the doldrums. But some executives also noticed the new traditionalists. George Strait, Reba McIntyre, Ricky Skaggs. They were still selling their records. In the eyes of Warner Brothers and our head, Martha Sharp, perhaps an opportunity. And Martha was talking with a girl named Judy Harris. was telling her about they were looking for a traditional country singer. So Judy told her that Charlie Muff is working with somebody that, that sings that way, a songwriter. And so uh, Martha called Charlie, and Charlie said, go out to the palace and listen to us, and Martha did. I didn't really know Martha, only, but only by reputation. And so I called her and told her that I'd seen Randy, really liked him, and if she was thinking about signing him, that I definitely wanted to put my hat in the ring. And she's gone on record as saying that phone call was what uh, pushed her over the edge to go ahead and sign him to Warner Brothers. It took years and years of rejection and a desperate country music industry to get it done, but there it was, Randy's major label record deal. 
Uh, your real name is not Randy Travis, is it? No, I, uh, I went by Randy Ray for a while, and then before that went by Randy Trawick, which is my real name, T-R-A-Y-W-I-C-K. But nobody could uh, remember that name. They, they would say Trailways or Tirewick or Treadways. They'd never get it right. Warner Brothers quickly changed his name. Yeah, that was actually Martha. She said she just sort of woke up one morning in her house and was thinking about it. And she was thinking about Merle Travis and, and just other, you know, iconic names or something. And she said, Randy Travis. And she said, that just felt good to her and sounded right. And she ran it by Randy and Elizabeth and they both liked it. And that was it. Several people have come up uh, and say things like, I was a big fan of your daddy's. And uh, I say, who are you talking about? You know, and I say, Merle Travis. I, well, he's not my daddy. Uh, in fact, I'm no kin to him. I never met him. While executives like Martha Sharp were likely concerning themselves with how on earth they'd market this young traditional country singer, commercial appeal really hadn't crossed Kyle Lenning's mind. I never really thought about it in terms of whether he was going to be successful or not. That almost didn't matter to me. Instead, as would prove to be his style over the years, Kyle remained fixated on making the best record for the unique talent that stood before him. Of course, song selection was paramount. Well, in Randy's case, there, there, were, there were really four of us that were involved in that. There was Randy, there was Elizabeth, there was Martha Sharp, and there was me. And we would sit down uh, when we were getting ready to make a record and start listening to songs that we had each collected individually or together and, and start to pick out what we felt like were the strongest songs. When we look for songs, we don't care who writes it, whether I write it or wherever it comes from, as long as we think it's a great song. When Randy was first signed to Warner Brothers, Kyle put the word out in town that they were looking for traditional sounding country songs. One day he got a cassette tape in the mail from a song plugger at MCA Music Publishing. Pat Higdon. Uh, and I knew Pat. I, I had worked with Pat a lot. Really good song guy. So he put this thing in the mail, didn't call me and tell me it was coming, nothing. It just showed up in the mail. So, wow, MCA, I opened it up, put it in and listened to it, and it was on the other hand. As the story goes, on the other hand had quite the journey before making it to Kyle Lenning. It was written by songwriting demigods Paul Overstreet and Don Schlitz. Don and Paul are just the ultimate great, great songwriters. I mean, Don wrote The Gambler. You know, he wrote a, a bunch of big, big hits. Paul, Paul too, you know, Paul wrote a lot of, a lot of great songs. Don and Paul wanted the traditional sounding, on the other hand, to go to a traditional artist, but one they knew, preferably. They first reportedly pitched the song to country music legends Merle Haggard and George Jones. Yesterday's wine, yesterday's wine. But they each passed on the song. So they eventually sent a demo of the song Kyle Lanning's Way with a specific artist in mind. We pitched the song for Dan Seals, and Dan was, at that time, Dan was selling around 250,000 units. Co-writer Paul Overstreet. Just as Kyle Lanning was starting to produce Randy Travis, his other charge, Dan Seals, was just starting to register one country hit after another. And I think God must be a cowboy at heart. Kyle, my producer, produces a guy named Randy Travis, and the cat's got it. You're talking a, a lifetime guy in, this, in the business now. You see people come and go, but I'll bet this guy's going to be there 30 years. A prophetic Dan Seals himself from right around this time. He's got a great voice. He loves music and he's a nice person. Mm -hmm. But yet he's, he's, he's authentic. He's lived it. Incidentally, England Dan gets his own episode. But that's who Pat Higdon had in mind when he sent the song to Kyle. And I immediately called Pat and said, love this song. Let's put it on hold. And, and that, what that means is, is that when a producer or, or a record company person calls a publisher and asks them to put a song on hold, that means you're, you're very seriously considering recording it and you would like it not to be pitched to other artists. But co-writer Paul Overstreet was less than thrilled. Then they called me and, and Kyle had said, I don't hear it for Dan, but I'm doing this new artist called Randy Travis and I'd like to cut it on him. And, and then the word I heard was is that Paul was not 
Paul was upset that this guy that he had never heard of had put the song on hold. And I thought, well, I was about to do my record deal, so I thought, well, if we're going to do it on a new artist, I probably will hold on to it because maybe it'd be a song I would do. This is funny because I'm thinking in my own head that I actually was controlling whether or not they had cut it or not. And I think it had already been decided they were going to give it to him. But in my own mind, I was just driving down the road one day and I thought of that little Bible verse that like went through my head. It's more blessed to give than receive. And so uh, I just went, yeah, you can have it. Go ahead. But I think they were already going to do it anyway. Regardless, good move, Paul. The Don Schlitz and Paul Overstreet co-write became one of the first songs Randy would record for Warner Brothers. Keith Stegall would actually co-produce this early batch with Kyle Lanning. Thankfully, Keith and Kyle had an abundance of quality session musicians to choose from. One of the blessings of Nashville is that the musicians that have been available to make those records are stunning. I mean, Larry London was a just a phenomenal musician, a great drummer. David Hungate who was the bass player in Toto, uh, moved to Nashville in the 80s, and he started working with us a lot. Uh, Matt Rollins is a brilliant uh, piano player, but we used Pig Robbins, too. We were, you know, Pig was was a a player that we used a lot. Doyle Grisham played Steel on the early Randy records. Doyle's on the road with Jimmy Buffett now, and Doyle's great. Steve Gibson played on those those early records. He's just a brilliant, brilliant guitarist. You know, just just bless Mark O'Connor. I mean, his fiddle playing was like listening to another singer. I, it's re, it's very difficult to make a bad record with those people. Case in point, the very first single by Randy Travis, 1985's On the Other Hand. But on the other hand, there's a golden band. And it was a flop. You know, on the other hand, when it was released the first time, died in the 60s in the charts. Despite the strength of the track, perhaps not a huge shock for anybody involved. It was, after all, the first single of an artist that sounded quite different. But among the relatively few that did catch on to Randy's first single was another budding traditional country singer. Some three months after Randy released his version of On the Other Hand, Young Keith Whitley included a version of the song on his October 1985 album, L.A. to Miami. But the reason I must go is on the other hand. Honestly, I didn't know anything about that at the time. Keith, Keith Whitley, a great, great singer. So, And I never, I never even heard his version of it, and I'm glad I didn't because, uh, I, you know, both Randy and I might have been intimidated. Thankfully for them, Whitley's version was never released as a single, so Kyle and Randy never encountered it. Instead, they carried on, finding and recording tunes. And with the next single, Randy really started drawing some serious attention. It would become a Randy Travis staple, the classic 1982. Operator, please connect me with 19. How high did 1982 go? It got to number six or seven. I can't remember which one. That sort of opened the door. Yeah, it, it definitely opened the door for me. 1982 represented Randy Travis's first taste of success. He actually broke the top ten with an anachronistic old school country sound. The public might yet have some use for this traditional country singer. And now there was a real decision about what his next single should be. I, I was very vocal about re-releasing on the other hand. I'd heard the record on the radio, didn't think I could make a better record than that on Randy Travis, especially at that time, and and felt like there was a, sort of enough indication that, you know, they had gotten an order for 10,045s for jukeboxes in Texas, you know, the very first time they put the record out. It had gone to number one in Meridian, Mississippi. There were some places where it had done really well. And all those signs sort of told me that, it, it was worth the gamble to put that out again. In an interesting maneuver, less than a year after the first release of On the Other Hand, Warner Brothers would re-release it as Randy Travis's third single. Was On the Other Hand released twice? Yeah, it was released, uh, well, it was about a year ago now, the first time, and it didn't do 
uh, very well. I think he got up to like number 67. And uh, then on 1982 did real well. And then the folks at Warner Brothers wanted to uh, release On the Other Hand again, and I'm glad they did. And it went to number one, of course, it was CMA Song of the Year, and it blew up. It is Randy Travis. Oh, oh well, thank the Lord for this. Uh, all the folks at Warner Brothers have been so good to me, and especially Martha Sharp, and I appreciate that. And my producer, Kyle Lenning, who I think is great, and uh, my manager, Lib Hatcher, who has always been behind me. I love her and thank her so much. The result was amazing. It was the same song, released two different times in a year, but the difference was stark. With the second issue of On the Other Hand, the industry had decided it was ready for Randy Travis. I just think it was one of those things, Jack, when, you know, it happens from time to time when some, some new voice or something pops up and people, people go, oh, that's what we've been looking for. Do you have a lot of people coming up to you and sort of in one way or another kind of uh, thanking you for bringing, I don't know, real country music back around? Do you hear a lot of that from people? Yeah, we sure do. A lot of people tell us that. Uh, uh, that that's a good compliment to me because that's exactly what we're doing. Nothing but country. Now with some sudden and serious momentum, Randy and his team followed up with the release of his full-length debut album, Storms of Life. Lord, what a price I've had to pay Storms of life are washing me away The old school country album went straight to number one and sold millions of copies. It's a country music classic, if you haven't heard it. Along with the previously released singles from Randy, some of the cuts on the album include the self-written Reasons I Cheat. Yes, I'm Heart-wrenching breakup number, No Place Like Home. There's no place like home. And the follow-up number one single, Digging Up Bones. Yeah, tonight I'm sitting alone, digging up bones. Much like On the Other Hand, another signature song of Randy's. And also like On the Other Hand, another Paul Overstreet co-write. Before Randy cut it, it was first cut by the great Mel Tillis. Across this lonely bedroom of a recent broken home Yet at night I'm sitting alone, digging up bones At one point it was Mel himself who quipped that the song was a little too short, needed another verse. So, Paul Overstreet and co-writer Al Gore wrote one. But it never made the album, neither Mel's nor Randy's. We never heard a version of that song with that verse in it. And it was later, uh, it's interesting because later on we did a, uh, a 25th anniversary album with Randy where we did a bunch of his hits as duets. And Digging Up Bones was done with John Anderson. And it's a great, great version of that. John sings the fool out of it. We added the fourth verse for that. I just kept on wishing I could taste your kisses sweet. I found an old cold chicken egg that I'd been gnawing on And a night I'm sitting alone digging up bones You know, gnawing on a chicken bone or something like that. I can't, it's, you know, it, it's a great verse. Even without the chicken bone verse, Randy's original recording of Digging Up Bones would, like its predecessor, hit number one. And there, in the back half of 1986, how far Randy and his team had come since a year previous, putting together a record they weren't sure anybody was going to buy. When we, were get, when we finished the whole album, Randy and I sat there and I said, you know, I've figured out how much we've spent on this album, which was not very much. I figured out that if we sell 40,000 albums, they might let us make another one, which was really the only thing I wanted to be able to do is make, one, make another record with him. And it ended up selling 4 million albums. So, you know, that tells you how much I knew about how successful he was going to be. And with those kinds of numbers, the record label didn't just allow Kyle and Randy to make another record. They insisted that the team get straight back to work. You've been too gone for too long. By the second album, uh, I mean, we were still kind of the, the, the new kid on the block doing the old thing. 
And so people still weren't sort of trolling for the same kind of songs that we were looking for. Don and Paul, you know, bless them, came up with Forever and Ever, Amen. I'm going to love you forever and ever, forever and ever, amen. That's probably Randy's biggest record. That can't be overstated. It was another Don Schlitz and Paul Overstreet co-write that Martha Sharp encountered on her desk one day. And she played it for us, and we, you know, it, it was immediately apparent that this was going to be a, a, a big song for Randy. Kyle and Randy really used the same formula they used on the first album, but this song actually had a special ingredient. Yeah, I think it's actually the first time it's heard on a record. Um, when we recorded the record, there was the intro was just the downbeat, and the whole band was in. And I, I thought it needed a little something before the band came in to sort of tip its hat to the record. And Paul Franklin, who's a brilliant musician, Paul played steel on a lot of the records I've worked on, and, and particularly on Randy's records too. Paul Franklin's father was a, a, an instrument builder. He, was, he played steel, but he also built steel guitars. But he built what was called the pedal bro. And it was a, a dobro, an acoustic a uh, dobro that used pedals like a steel, so it bent the strings. My dad said, I think I got to figure out how to build a pedal dobro. I said, what? <laughs> he said, well, you want me to build you one? I said, well, yeah. sure. So he built the, the very first one that he built is the one I played on Forever and Ever. And it's the intro. I think it was probably first take. <laughs> you know, it's not it's not like I had to sit there and tell him what to play, you know, it's like <laughs> the rest, as they say, is history. Forever and ever amen, one of the first tunes to feature the Franklin pedal bro, reached number one in June of nineteen eighty seven. It was the CMA and ACM song of the year, and heck, it won a Grammy Award. Best country <laughs> song is Forever and Ever Amen, Paul Overstreet and Don Slick. Congratulations. And for it to be the lead single on his sophomore album was, you know, just a, an incredible good fortune for us. Because, that, I mean, that album sold five million copies. And the other three singles from Randy's sophomore album, I Won't Need You Anymore, Too Gone for Too Long, and the self-written I Told You So, all hit number one. I told you so. And by that point, Randy Travis had become the face of the entire genre. He had a few things going for him. First and foremost, that voice and his traditional style. After years of the urban cowboy-influenced country music, Randy appealed to pretty much all listeners. I have videotape of him from a, a trip we took in over to Knoxville to play at the county fair over there in Knoxville, Tennessee. And there were... 80 year old people and you know 10 year old kids and i've got videotape of all of them singing the lyrics to the songs he's singing live there's like an 80 year old woman singing along with digging up bones and then there's a 10 year old kid singing the same lyric and it's like you know that's just i don't, I don't know what you say about that that's just kind of a phenomenon a phenomenon that really and truly changed the entire country music landscape traditionalism was in the only thing that keeps me hanging on I don't understand Oh, darling If my heart had windows These people you've mentioned uh, and myself and George Strait, Reba McIntyre, people like that are doing traditional country music. And uh, so we're considered new traditionalists in my way of thinking. We're just doing songs, uh, you know, traditional country music that, well, Merle or George or Hank or Lefty would have recorded 15, 20 years ago. But it wasn't just his sound that drew the public towards him. Many found the square-jawed Carolinian to be quite handsome. You realize <laughs> you are the current Cinderella of country music. Yeah. And, of course... Cinderella might have been a little prettier, but uh, certainly not in... 
No! <laughs> but certainly not any more successful. And on top of that, he was a true gentleman. I saw him in situations that were stressful, and he handled them with an incredible grace, especially with his fans. He was just always really generous with his fans. I watched him sign autographs for hours in uh, unplanned situations where he, we might have been out to dinner somewhere or at a show in Vegas, and the next thing you know, there's a line a half mile long waiting to get an autograph from him. And I watched him sign every one of them, you know, with patience and and he had that ability to to talk to people and and make them feel like he was actually more interested in them than they were in him which frankly was curious not what one might expect given his criminal youth it's hard for me to imagine the troubled youth when i was spending as much time with him as i was having said that i saw some a couple of times where i can't even remember ex exact situations where there would be something where he would be appropriately angry about something and he could get really angry that that part of his personality was was always there and from time to time the world got to see it most notably when the subject of his personal life came up as a newly famous person and a country music heartthrob randy had to adjust to widespread public fascination and with that came questions and rumors. One such rumor was that the young, handsome, and perpetually single Randy Travis was gay, which in the late 80s would have been met with more public derision than it would be now. Other rumors that made it back to Randy concerned his relationship with his manager and mentor, Lib Hatcher, who was nearly 20 years his senior and had served as a guardian figure. Now, I'll tell you in advance, if you don't want to answer this, don't. And I only ask it because there's a little thing in Time Magazine. Uh, it's, it's the kind of question I hate asking as, as a reviewer, but is your relationship a personal as well as a uh, uh, it's work. Oh, okay, that just, that, I, that's what I thought, but that quote just threw me off. Now, it turns out those rumors about Randy and Lib actually had some merit all along. I'm not the kind of guy to pry into people's private lives, but I was around them all the time. And, uh, but you know, they were not publicly affectionate between, between them. You know, they, it was a, it, it was also a business and it was a very serious business and, um, Lib handled it, you know, a, a very seriously. And I don't think she wanted to confuse the issue. Um, but eventually it, it came, it, it, it was, it was one of those relationships that just had to get clear. And, and, uh, so, you know, they were married, I think, in 91 or 2. Which, for a time, quelled the rumor mill. And really, other than in those situations, Randy Travis remained more or less unperturbed by success. He steadfastly remained himself. This is a pretty well-known story, but I always love telling it. Early on, when his first album was really just blowing up the charts, uh, he came into Warner Brothers and they said, Randy, look, and they, they pulled out the, the Billboard Top 200, I guess the Top 200 records in the country. And he was like at number four or something on there. And he saw, he's like, you know, other people's names on there, like Bruce Springsteen and other, you know, other, other people that weren't country artists. And he said, is that the pop charts? He said, am I on the, he said, if I'm on the pop charts, get me off there. I'm not a pop artist. I'm a country artist. Get it off there. And, and they said, no, no, you don't understand. He said that that's, these are just the biggest records in the country. It doesn't matter what, what the genre is. And then he, he sort of said, oh, oh, okay, all right, then that's all right. Randy was so genuine that he was hostile towards the prospect of crossing over. He was very, you know, always very clear, Jack, about, of course, he wanted to be successful, but it was more important for him to be faithful to the music he was making than it was to try to be successful. Which, in Randy's case, is ironically why he remained so successful. In fact, the hit-making would continue through the rest of the decade. Don Schlitz and Paul Overstreet earned themselves the hat-trick of Randy Travis number ones with 1988 single, Deeper Than the Holler. My love is deeper than the holler Stronger than the river Higher than the pine trees growing tall Honky Tonk Moon was another big single off the third album. Honky Tonk Moon Keep shining on my baby and me. 
But as the industry was changing, thanks to Randy's own impact, traditional country songs were becoming harder to come by. By the third album, the music business started chasing that. And so songs started to become a little bit more difficult to get a hold of. Which explained some of the less conventional songs Randy would cut on later records, like the smash hit Hard Rock Bottom of Your Heart. To the hard rock bottom of your heart to the hard rock bottom of your heart. Randy loved that song immediately, just liked everything about it. So, you know, Randy, Randy, as true as he as he is to his traditional roots, is is still adventurous. Another example, the neat Skip Ewing tune, If I Didn't Have You. If I didn't have you, I know I'd be floundering around like a ship at sea. Lost in the rain of a hurricane, and that's where I'd have been. Now, to me, that's a really great example of something that had that felt modern or unique, but still had all of the Randy uh, country character in it. Who played the uh, the guitar uh, lick in the big? That I think it's an acoustic. <laughs> yeah, it's in the gut string. Uh, here I've been bragging on all these great country session musicians. We got in the studio to record that song, and the demo was just a guitar vocal demo. And it was Skip Ewing singing and playing. And that lick was part of that demo. I mean, it was right there. And I and we had, you know, I think Mark Cass Stevens and Larry Byram, two wonderful guitarists, wonderful musicians. We started playing that. Neither one of them could actually play it. And so I God bless Nashville. I get on the phone and I call Troy Tomlinson, who was the publisher of that song. And I said, Troy, it, do you have a number for Skip Ewing? Do you think he might be in town? And he said, yeah, I think I, I think I do. And I think he is. And I called Skip and said, man, we're trying to cut your song, but, but nobody can play your, your part. Can you come? Do you have time today to come by? And he was over there in 30 minutes. And that Skip you hear on the record. Classic Randy Travis tune. <laughs> In 1990, Randy Travis's years of resolutely reviving old-school country music culminated in the Heroes and Friends album. They brought a whole bunch of old-school country acts in for duets with Randy. Old country boys around You must have felt that same you know, everybody that we used, worked with on that record r really loved him uh, for who he was and what was going on. And, and the fact that he had sort of refocused people to the, the, the beauty of real country music. The record had everyone. George, Loretta, Merle, Roy Rogers. Just sing a song and bring the sunny weather. Happy trails to you. Till we meet again. You have to understand, Roy Rogers at that time was a living legend. I got the opportunity to spend some time with Roy and talk with him about some of that, uh, the traveling that he did when he was with on the road with Trigger. And uh, uh, in fact, we recorded a song with him. Everybody that was recording that version of Happy Trails, we were all kids when Roy's show was huge. So he was in the middle of just this huge germ fest of all of us guys just talking about Nellie Bell and, you know, Trigger and all these, all this stuff going on. And Larry London was there just, you know, just loving it. And we must have, we must have spent a good hour wearing him out. An opportunity really only afforded by all the goodwill Randy had earned among the old timers. He had barely gone five years in the spotlight, and here he was with a cemented legacy. But, as naturally happens, the spotlight on Randy would start to fade as the 90s wore on. There were changes in country music. Folks like label mate Travis Tritt were coming in and popularizing a new, harder-edged sound. And while the public still had time for Randy Travis, he was far from the only game in town, and the hits were slowing up. And praise when I heard you whisper my name. After Whisper My Name hit number one in 94, Randy wouldn't top the charts again for the rest of the decade. 
he started focusing his efforts on acting, appearing in several films and TV shows, such as Touched by an Angel. Wayne, please, would you just listen? Listen to her, Wayne. She's an angel. Shut up, Joey. It's a mess over there. And you're lucky they're not going to arrest you. He was frightened. He reacted the only way he That's knows That's no how. excuse. Yes, it is. He's your brother. He needs some understanding. Who the hell do you think you are? As he was finding his footing in the acting world, the team that helped make Randy Travis from the get-go started to break apart. And I had been running Asylum Records for about six years in that period. From 92 to 98, I was president of Asylum Records. And the amount of time Kyle had for producing Randy became very limited. So Randy moved on to other producers. He also left Warner Brothers Records for DreamWorks Records in the late 90s, meaning Martha Sharp was now out of the picture. By the year 2000, Randy Travis's musical career was looking a bit listless, albeit not for long. Rest assured, the triumphant comeback is coming. You know, I haven't really thought about this very much, so you're getting, you're getting some new material from me. It began with Kyle Lenning leaving Asylum Records. I had left the label in 98, and then DreamWorks folded as a record company. So, so he was without a label. And so we were both, both of us were sort of unemployed. Until one executive named Barry Landis got involved. He was first the vice president of Atlantic Records' Christian division before becoming president of the Christian label Word Records. And he was the one who requested Kyle and Randy to make a gospel album. Conveniently, Randy was starting to head that direction anyway. Gospel-type tunes, in fact, occasionally made their way onto some of Randy's 90s albums. I'm gonna have a little talk with Jesus when I get home tonight. I'm gonna tell him all about my troubles and I know he'll make them right. So, Randy was already poised to cut his first full-length Christian album, called Inspirational Journey. It had a song on there called Drive Another Nail. I've got the scars on these two hands that show I haven't failed. But I don't want to drive another nail. The album didn't top the charts, but it also didn't tank. And it was a heck of a lot of fun to make. So they followed up with 2002's Rise and Shine. Raise Him Up might have been on that album, which is one of my favorite songs I've ever done with Randy. I'll provide for you. Walk beside of you. I am strong enough. It's a stellar track, but there's a more famous one from the same album. And I was also producing um, Michael Peterson at the time with Blake Chancey for Columbia. And about that time, Michael Peterson brought me this song. And he said, I found this song and I think it's perfect for Randy. And I, I played it and I said, you know, I think it's a hit. I think this is a, it's an odd, odd song, but it's a hit. And I think it, you're the guy that needs a hit. You found this song. Why don't we do it on you? And he said, I don't hear it for me. And I said, gosh, Michael, I just, I just, I don't know, man. Anyway, we took it to Columbia and they said, no, we don't want to, we don't hear it for Michael and we're not going to, we're not going to do it. And, I, and so I felt like I'd done due diligence and, and it's like, I tried everything I could. And so I sent the song to Randy who immediately loved it. And uh, that was Three Wooden Crosses. There are three wooden crosses on the right side of the highway. Why there's not four of them, heaven only knows. Ironically, for a man whose career was pretty much defined by its unexpected stratospheric rise at a time when the industry wanted nothing to do with him, it may well be this tune released when he had already been an icon for over a decade. That constitutes his least likely hit. It struggled its way up the charts. It was an odd tune. Had a, it had one of those twists in it that if you didn't really pay attention to it, you didn't get it. And it ended up, uh, thanks to Barry and his promotion team at Word Records, that ended up being a number one country record in NSAI Song of the Year, CMA Song of the Year. I, it was it was a huge hit for Randy. Three Wooden Crosses, written by Douglas Johnson and Kim Williams. Doing an interview a while back, somebody said, you know, you think recording a gospel album may have hurt your career? I said, well, no. <laughs> 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 
Randy would ultimately put out five gospel albums before returning to secular music at the end of the decade. 2008's Around the Bend would feature the song Love is a Gamble, with longtime Kyle Lenning stablemate Dan Seals on harmony vocals. You see, love is a gamble. It's a chance that you take. And within six months of that record, he and Next Generation superstar Carrie Underwood would make a repeat hit out of his old tune, I Told You So. Now, what you you say say the table's time? Would you say I told you so? It's befitting that that song, which first appeared way, way back on the Randy Ray live album, would, in this duet form, be Randy Travis's last hit. The next several years would prove really difficult for our protagonist. In 2010, at 51 years of age, Randy would part ways with his wife, manager, and mentor, Lib Hatcher, in a particularly bitter way. Amid allegations of infidelity, Randy and Lib would divorce before suing each other for all sorts of money. And now, here he was for the first time since his teens, without the woman that kept him on the straight and narrow. In state headlines for the second time this year, country singer Randy Travis has been charged with driving while intoxicated. Officers say Travis's breath smelled of alcohol and he was not wearing any clothes. You goddamn got the right to do me this way, motherfucker. No, you don't. And within a year came his dire medical crisis. Overnight, the country star suffered a stroke, a serious complication of congestive heart failure after the 54-year-old contracted a viral infection. Randy and current wife, Mary, would remain in the hospital for five and a half grueling months. The legendary singer was left with aphasia, or the inability to communicate with long sentences. Randy, how you feeling? Good. Yeah. Yeah. You coming back? Well, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> We're working hard at it. Yeah. To this day, Randy has been working with current wife Mary to regain function. And in the meantime, his career has taken a new shape. Instead of recording and performing, Randy now serves as a country music figurehead and elder statesman, encouraging younger artists and appearing at award shows and events. In turn... Folks in the industry are never shy in reminding the public about the singer who, in their view, saved country music. Ask any artist who's one of the singular guys who helped revive country music, they all say Randy Travis. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Randy Travis single-handedly saved country music. There's a whole lot of people that respect and love him and are grateful for what he did for this music, stood up for it in a time when, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't in vogue to be that, that much of a really traditional country singer, you know, and he had the guts to do that, and he's always had the utmost respect for me. Ladies and gentlemen, the newest member of the Country Music Hall of Fame, Randy Travis. Of course, they're right. Country music's obituary was written in the mid-80s. Records weren't selling. Nashville had truly lost its way. When Randy Travis broke, finally broke, that is, after years in obscurity, it was clear. That sound they crafted, Randy and Kyle Lenning and Lib Hatcher and Martha Sharp and all the players and writers, that sound would set the bar for generations to come. It struck a chord with everyone, 80-year-olds and 10-year-olds alike. It's why, in this podcaster's view, multiple decades and a debilitating health crisis since his last hit, Randy Travis is still as relevant as anybody in the genre. He's a genuine throwback and the real deal, and he changed country music entirely. That's all I got for you today, folks. A very, very special thanks to the great Kyle Lenning. It is an absolute privilege to have such an instrumental figure help tell this tale. Also, for all those interested, indeed that is a pedal bro on the theme music, played by none other than the steel guitar extraordinaire, Mike Johnson. He's played on a thousand different records. Thanks, Mike, for contributing. My name is Jack Shaw. Thanks for tuning in to the Neon Neighbors Podcast. <laughs>